This podcast is part of the No Phony Podcast Network, the home of independent awesomeness. Everybody, welcome to another episode of Deluxe Edition, the show where we like to dig into classic pop culture. I am Bill Sebald, your host. With me, as always, is the big man himself, Mr. Casey Shearer. Hello. You How are, you doing, Bill? You are a big man, sir. How tall are you? Uh, if I stand up straight, 6'2". Wow. You're, you're a pure man. You're, you're a coxman. <laughs> I bet you have a chest like a rug. Anyway, so... We had a, a great talk with our guest today, um, Mr. Mark Singer, right? What do we know Mark from? Mark has been in lots of cool 80s things that I am a huge fan of, Beastmaster being one of his, probably his most, uh, at least in the circles I run, in the most uh, famous of his roles. Do you ever, how old were you when you saw Beastmaster? Uh, 39. Why'd you wait so long? Aren't you, wait, aren't you 39 now? Yeah. Son of a bitch. So this was all new to you. Uh, Bill, almost everything that we talk about on this show is new to me. Not true. Not true. You're pretty You're pretty up on the uh, horror stuff. You're probably better at horror stuff than I am. No. You don't think I'm, so? I, I pretend. I pretend good. <laughs> you're a great liar. <laughs> well, what did you think of Beastmaster at 39? Did it hold up for you? Yeah, I thought it was great. I, I wish we could find Beastmaster 2 and 3. I wonder why we can't find this thing anywhere. <laughs> I don't know. They actually are on YouTube. Is it like you can pay for it or is it a, a illegal upload? No, it's an illegal upload. Yeah. I remember the second one. He he left whatever. <laughs> like, I don't even know. Was he on a distant planet? I can't remember if Beastmaster was on another planet. But all of a sudden it's like, hey, we got this idea. Let's take Beastmaster and let's put him on Earth. Like, that's the worst. Like, you know that. The, the first off, you know the production has no money because they're not going to build a set. They're going to just use Earth. Or they're going to use shit that's already there. And they don't have to pay for extra costumes because they can just use regular clothes off the rack at, you know, the gap. So anytime they do that, that to me is a, is a bad sign. Remember when you ever see the Star Trek, I think it was four, where they came to Earth. It's like, ooh, that's a bad call. <laughs> no, I think not a, not a Trekkie, Bill. The Masters of the Universe, they made a He-Man movie and they were like, we have this giant idea what we want to do with this thing. And the producers are, I don't know who it was. Somebody's like, nope, scrap all that. Bring them to Earth. <laughs> what? Yeah, they're going to come to Earth and then we can just shoot on Earth and we don't have to fucking worry about the budget. We don't have to make a fucking castle, Gray Skull. We just use a fucking garage. But getting back to Mark. So what did you think of the interview? I thought it was great. This was one of my, this was one of my favorites. Mine too. Uh, Mark, yeah, he had a lot to say and uh yeah this was this was a really fun one he was yeah. very animated so a lot of the times i cut a lot of things out of the interviews like ums and pauses and stuff like that but just the mark is a is a theater actor like a shakespearean theater actor and just how animated he is and and just the motions and everything i didn't cut a whole lot of this one out of yeah the video, so I know what you mean. Like there was, it, it was a, a really easy conversation because he would almost deliver a line. He would deliver an answer like a Shakespearean actor. <laughs> it was so easy to see where that answer would end. So I could just roll with my next question. Yeah. It was a really nice fluid uh, conversation. Probably my favorite episode so far. Yeah. We got a lot of great uh, fan questions for this one too. So uh, that was, that was fun. And uh, I think, I think that that's been a really fun part of the, the interview for a lot of the, or the show for a lot of these guests are fan questions. Yeah. I've noticed their, their faces light up a bit when we give them a good question. Yeah. So everyone keep sending in your questions, join the Facebook group, the deluxe edition Facebook group. Cause in there, Casey, I think you were asking now for questions for, I think Burt Ward. Yep. What else do we have coming up? 
We have Burt Ward coming up. Uh, I'm working on uh, Tom Skerritt. I'm working on Fiona Dorif from uh, the Chucky movies. Uh, we have Victor Miller coming up, the writer of the very first Friday the 13th. Who's embroiled in a lawsuit right now, so we'll have to be careful what we ask him, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a couple other ones we have lined up. Uh, Deborah Voorhees from uh, Friday the 13th Part 5, I believe uh ryan lambert another monster squad fellow it's crazy how uh how fast we've grown as a show in uh 21 weeks this is our 20th episode this is our 21st episode buddy mark singers oh yeah Boom! this is our 20th episode that's right. See, I like this. I like when you make the mistakes instead of me. It's usually me making the fucking mistakes. Well, why don't we get to it, Casey? It's a uh, this one went a little long, and not long like a, a it's a bad thing. But you know, the less jibber jabbering we do, the more I think people will get to hang out and listen to the great stuff that Mark was telling us. Hope you guys like it as much as as we do. We talked about everything from Beastmaster to V, um, his his like Casey mentioned his stage work. Uh, you know, and he was, he, he showed us a, a, a pretty cool thing. If you get a chance to watch our video, if you didn't realize these podcasts actually have video components, I would recommend you go to YouTube and watch the video piece as well, because uh, a lot of cool little Easter eggs in those videos and something that he shows us, I thought was special as hell. And uh, not going to get yeah, away. You got to yeah, watch. That was really cool. That was very cool. We got a really nice email from Mark after the interview saying how uh, much he appreciated us talking to him. And uh, he wanted everyone to go to YouTube. And if you're interested in any of his stage work, you can find uh, Mark Singer. If you just type in Mark Singer Taming of the Shrew uh, on YouTube and you find him uh, doing a little acting on stage. Yeah, he's good. He's really yeah. good. All right. So how about without further ado, as I'm trying to do my uh, my stage voice, without further ado, please welcome. How could I do Shakespeare? I, I can't even like recite a line. I'm so stupid. I don't even know a shit to be or not to be. Nah. That sounded pretty good. Uh, you could do it. No. Maybe if someone held cue cards for you. I'm going to be um, Mark's protege. I'm, I'm going in. I'm going to become a Shakespearean actor. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem is I... I now you fucking trip on my tongue all the time. It's probably not uh, the the future for me. Maybe not Shakespearean work, porn work. I could probably. <laughs> Fuck. All right, you know what? I'm shutting up. Let's go to the interview. All right, sounds good. Hey, Mark, thanks for coming on to the show. I have a bunch of questions for you here, and we have some fan questions as well. Uh, we'd love to ask you. That's so, cool. we are big Beastmaster fans, as well as everybody in our audience. So I'm curious about the movie. The movie seemed really big. It seemed really ambitious for 1982. Was that, were you guys going for something gigantic? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you have to understand it was 1982 was a, a different time in filmmaking. It was a different time in the industry. And a project like that was, um, you could, it was classic big movie making. You know, you had a, a story in the in the old days, they would have advertised it as a story as big as all outdoors because we had uh, all the big sky elements and we had the vaccinery and we had the continuing action and, and, and uh, horses and stunts and romance and danger and swordplay. It was an exciting time and it, and it was a big event. No question about it. It was big. And we had. Uh, we had wonderful talent on board. We had John Amos, we had uh, Rip Torn, we had, uh, you know, so, so many wonderful actors and actresses. And of course, Tanya Roberts, you know, you can't, you can't go wrong there. So, <laughs> although I tried. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I may be the Beastmaster, but I'm only human. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. I'm thinking about the movies that came before. I, I can't think of a movie that was bigger than Beastmaster. And I know I don't mean bigger like Star Wars was massive, but even that scale didn't seem as big as the scale of your production. Was there something that inspired it? As much as anything, that that has to do with the uh, sincerity of the effort. We had um, uh, John Alcott as our cinematographer. 
and he was the award-winning, the Academy Award-winning director uh, of photographer photography for uh, Barry Lyndon. And so we had the very best cinematographer event, you know, arguably uh, of his day filming us. And, and we had um, we had access to the Stuntmen's Association, the old guard, the, the original guys that were in all the Westerns from the 1950s and 60s on television. And these were as tough and rough a bunch of, of uh, uh, I hope they I hope they don't uh, take it hard, but uh, as rough and tough a bunch of old cowboys and codgers that come across, uh, they were double tough. So when it came time to doing stunts, there was a lot to learn from them. And there was a lot of fun in interacting with them if you got out alive. You know. If you got out alive. What does a cinematographer do? Because the movie is definitely big and beautiful. And it's got a, a cinematographer is not really somebody you hear much about. The cinematographer is responsible he was the cinematographer, I guess, the, uh, you would say in an illustrated book, he's the inker. He's the guy that puts the color and the tone and the shading into the entire production. He makes the background have its mood. He makes the characters think their thoughts by the way the shadows cut across. Them. He's the guy that gives the scope of the thing, if it's gigantic, as it was in The Beastmaster, and gives the glitter in the eye of the villain that makes us understand the, the, the evil flame that, that, that burns within. The cinematographer is responsible for giving the show that almost sensory flavor and odor that you get from watching it when you're in. It makes you feel you're immersed. Even though it's on the screen, you feel like it's pervading you and that you're a part of the action. That's the cinematographer. Does the director get to sort of be a co-cinematographer or does the director just kind of get the footage and say this is beautiful i love it well it's it's uh it's like anything else in uh in the creative process it depends on the quality of the director and the quality of the cinematographer and the experience of both and whether each holds the other in the proper regard and whether that regard is of a somewhat equal nature because a good director and a good cinematographer work as a kind of a team the director will might say you know what I'm trying to get is uh, uh, the idea of all of this, but at the same time, I want to make sure that I get that. How do you think we ought to go about this? And the cinematographer will, will say, well, I think that's a good plan being from over here. Why don't we try this? Why don't we start over here and then go over here? And then I can light from this direction and do that. And you can come back later and get another shot about this. And then the director might say, yeah, exactly. That will work for me. Or the director will say, instead of doing this, 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 what I want to do is not look at all of that. I just want to look at this one specific thing. How are we going to do that? You know, so so it's a it's a collaborative effort when it works best. Like all things in, in life, it's always better when it's a collaborative effort. So is the cinematographer and the director, are they the main creative forces in, in terms of designing how the whole movie works? Do they really partner up during a production usually? It's it's such a it's such a bureaucratic craft uh, because the cinematographer and the director can do what they can do, but then they have to refer to the producer who holds the purse strings and find out whether the budget will allow for this or for that. So there's always this dynamic tension between how much money is there, what do we want to do, and what can we do within the time and the limits. Of, what's of, of what we have. As far as the rest of the creative input, so much depends upon the action film like Beastmaster, the stunt coordinator, because the stunt coordinator is the guy that's also gonna step into the mix and say, what if we, listen, here's what, instead of doing that, why don't we bring three horses over the top, blow up half the world and, uh, and have a sword fight as well. We could do all that in the same amount of time that we're doing this. And, in, and instead of spending this much money doing that, why don't we take some of that budget and put it into this and make this a bigger event? And so that also enters into it. And then on top of that, you know, you have the, the uh, creative talent, the actors who hopefully are bringing something to it at their end where they say, let me add this or let me that, add that. Or how about if I do it this way or, you know, let me do my own stunts if I can, if I can manage. Have you ever worked with a director who was just, I wish you would all just shut up and let me do this my way. <laughs> Have you ever had a director who just was a little bit of a control freak? 
Yeah, that's that. They're, they're, they are very often the least successful. Uh, although there is the anomaly. There's John Ford, who apparently, who apparently was exactly like that. But he knew so much about what he was doing that this was always a proper response. So, yeah. <laughs> that's great. A salute. Um, yeah, I've definitely heard stories from other uh, productions where maybe the producer came in, and maybe the producer wasn't the most creative person. Like you said, he was the person with the wallet. But uh, did you ever have a situation where a producer was interfering with the, the creative vision and maybe, in a in a bad way, hurt the film or production? That, yes, but that's always a struggle, and that has to do when that when that happens. There's there's if you're an actor, there's very little say that you have in that. Uh, that's a struggle between the the creative people, director and cinematographer, chiefly director. Uh, and the producer, they have to work it out. Uh, there's, there's very little you can do. And that's why, that's why a really good director is highly skilled at doing the most with the least. Um, some of the greatest uh, noir epics that we love to watch, you know, were done on a shoestring budget because the director had to film them a certain way and had to accommodate certain things. And, and the cleanliness of the script and the pithiness of the performances uh, were the result of them. So, you know, a good director, a good director can make it happen. Hmm. So how did Beastmaster ultimately perform? I was seven when it came out, so I don't really remember fanfare or anything like that. I certainly remember seeing it young. So I, I'm pretty sure I was at the theater for it. How did it perform? Yeah. Did it meet your expectations? Did the public reception, was it strong? Was it weak? It's, it's, fun. it's a funny thing, you know, uh, in, back, in, back in my own childhood, Everything on, in television, I'm just generally speaking, generally, everything in television and everything in the films was all about cowboys. And so uh, the Lone Ranger was sort of the Batman of our day. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the iconic hero behind the mask. A loner would leave a silver bullet behind as a token that he had been there. And uh, one day in Hollywood, I was walking along the streets as an actor. And the next day I was essentially the Lone Ranger. I was the Beastmaster. And, uh, and that has given me a great sense of satisfaction and a great deal of pride. I just, I, I heard from someone the other day uh, that there's a, a video game, the title of which escapes me. And in the, in the video game, there's a, uh, you can obtain a certain power and it's called the Beastmaster power. And it allows you to do other things. So when you ask me how the show performed, I think it performed uh, beyond expectations because it's become a kind of a reference point in the history of cinema and in the history of the game, which means that it has, has outlived one venue and one generation and transmuted itself into another venue and another generation. And that is a real, I think, uh, tribute uh, to it. And I, I feel very, uh, very honored by that. You know, that may, I have to say, it makes me, it makes me happy. Yeah. You know, I got a 16 year old son who I'm showing all the 80s stuff to and just explaining to him, like, it was a world of wonder. Like we didn't see these things ever before. And my son has seen all these things before because of CGI and the movies he's seen, uh, yeah. you know, growing up. So he, he's missed out on that sort of, that imagination that I think you had to apply to a lot of movies in the eighties. But we also, in, in, in making the Beastmaster, what was fun about it was, well, there were a couple, there are a couple aspects of it that are, that are fairly interesting. I think one of them is that it was actually shot on film, a big Panaflex camera with a, a 35 millimeter stock, actual film running through the gates. And, uh, it was old fashioned movie making. And with all that means as well that the leading character, the title character was expected to do a good amount of his own stunts. And they weren't even considered stunts. They were just part of the, part of the equipment that you brought to work. The, 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 the fact that I was handy with a sword or ride a horse or could uh, or wanted to, to participate in uh, in in the action sequences and then as well the fact that we could just be standing around i was in a, like a leather hula skirt in the middle of the coldest winter on record 
in Los Angeles at that time. The winds were blowing down the sets at four o'clock in the morning when we were filming all night and people were, the rest of the crew was in parkas and ski masks and gloves. And we were standing out there in cheesecloth and leather skirts. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's like, Oh, actors, they're, they're not working very hard. Well, that sounds pretty awful. I don't think I would ever want to do that. So I'll tell you one thing that, that I, that, that, that people who are familiar with the Beastmaster might be interested in when they, at the end of the Beastmaster, for those who haven't seen it and to remind those who have, there's an enormous explosion and a wall of fire goes up in front of the evil castle. And, um, they kept saying, move back, everybody move back. You're gonna to wanna to go further. You're gonna to wanna to go further. No, further yet, further. And everybody all on all the sets, everybody wants to get close and watch the actions. So we really got way, way, way away. And there were, and there had been a, a couple of action sequences before this, so before the explosion. So there were a few actors lying dead, you know, uh, or wounded out in the field of play. And they said, okay, rolling, roll camera, you know. And when they touched off that explosion, boom, the entire Los Angeles County shook. A wall of flame went up about eight, 10 stories high. And then all that hot flaming glue began raining down like lava from above. And if you look closely, one of the dead actors seeing this stuff coming down jumps up and runs for his life <laughs> in, in the middle of that shot. <laughs> You only get to do that shot once, I guess. So you had to use the footage. Yeah, you can't do it again. Say, well, he was just pretending. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> but if you watch, you'll see him. He jumps, he goes, not me. <laughs> get up in Dales, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, I'm not getting paid enough for this. It's above my pay grade. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah, I didn't like the sandwich at lunch. I'm not staying. So I've heard, um, I think it was on the INDB page for Beastmaster. So the original author, uh, she was a novelist. If I have her name right, her name was Andre, Andre Norton. So the yeah. story goes that she didn't like the changes, the liberties that the movie made and decided that she didn't want to have her name on the on the movie. Is, is that true? <laughs> it, it sounds like something that any creative person would think. So I don't know. It sounds true enough to be true. I don't know anything about it, but... Uh... But uh, we're we're often our our own uh, our own worst uh, worst critics. I mean, here's a film that uh, uh, a book which may or may not have enjoyed uh, some popularity and made it uh, a worldwide uh, sensation that spawned two more films and then a whole television series filmed down in Australia, which lasted several years and still has life in it yet. So. Uh, it would be interesting to know what her thoughts might be today uh, if she were asked. Yeah. yeah, I definitely thought it was fascinating. Uh, you know, you still created the idea, even if some people had taken some liberties with your story, you still are the originator. I, I would think that I would want to be known yeah. and have my name in the credits if I could have, uh, if I would have been in, in that position. Writers are known. I, I, uh, I've done some, I wrote for a while for the, for the young and the restless, as a matter of fact. And I, and uh, I know that writers have a tendency to, to believe that every word is precious, you know, and it, and, uh, it isn't, <laughs> unless your name is William Shakespeare. <laughs> that makes sense. You came to that movie, uh, you were in really great shape. Was that you just already being in great shape or did you have to get in shape for the movie? You know, I was raised on, uh, I was raised in Texas on the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, I was certainly in no great shakes as a student. So I spent a lot of outdoor time on the beaches and, and in the waves. Um, and then uh, in those days, most of America, or a good part of America anyway, was still rural. So there was lots of horsebacking and stuff like that that, that, that I used to do. Um, but really, and I've always been, you know, basically athletic. It wasn't until I started studying uh, Kung Fu uh, in Seattle at the Seattle Kung Fu Club uh, that I that I really began to uh, that my that 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 physical ability began to find an external expression on the one hand, but also to imbue me with a with an understanding of of how to do all those things that I was doing in, in the Beastmaster. Yeah. 
How about swinging a sword? Where'd yeah. you learn that? <laughs> that's Seattle Kung Fu Club. That was that's all that's all you know based on uh, on Kung Fu on uh, Chinese martial arts. Um, but that's the other thing. If you stand on a set all day long swinging a piece of steel, you know, in between shots and and working on your on stuff, your muscles are always going to stay ready. Uh, and the more of that you do, the more you realize that like a, like a professional football player, that for all of the good shape that you're in when you get there, there's nothing like being in the moment of the activity to force you to be in the absolute diamond brightest shape that you can be. You know what I mean? Because the moment is going to come when some guy you've never seen before who stands two, three, four inches taller than you and maybe weighs 50 pounds more than you of solid muscle muscle is going to be swinging steel at you. You know, you, you better be ready. Yeah. When did the, when would you say, Hey, I need a stunt person for this, you know, being young and knowing what you're doing with the sword, you probably wanted to do all your own stunts. And I got to think the director was thinking, no, no, the insurance people won't let us do this. Well, actually, you would think so. But in this case, I blush to even say the name of, of Dean Kelly in the, in, and associate my own name anywhere in the, in the same space. But there are certain performers who you can, are so identifiable by their movement and by their physique and by the way they approach what they do uh, that, the, that, that it can be pretty glaring if it isn't them in, a, in one shot or another. And along with just being, you know, just the enthusiasm of youth and wanting to participate, I really felt that the way I moved was distinctive to how the character thought and felt. And so I really pushed to do as much as I could in that. And so I don't think the, I think the insurance only came into play uh, when they said, no, you'll die. <laughs> so we couldn't finish the movie. You have to stop. We, we all want to continue working. Yeah. What about explosions with uh, raining hot glue? <laughs> Maybe that would have been a thing they'd get, to get in you front know, of they, if they knew about it. The fire gags, the fire gags you can get close to, you can be integrated with to a certain degree. But when it comes to some of the hairier stuff, you can't do it. And, 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 and not only that, but, but there's, you know, working on a film set, you're like a small city, you're like a small town. Everybody knows each other. After a while, you really do, you know each other, you feel for each other, you push and pull together, you flow together as a team. And when you see a friend of yours suit up in a fire suit and get kicked from head to toe in flammable glue, and you know that in a couple of moments they're going to light this friend of yours on fire. It's a terrible feeling, and you, 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 my impulse is to rush in and say, "There's been a terrible mistake. <laughs> we can't do this." Uh, and just about the time that that I'm ready to jump in, they light him up, and then something happens, and then the shot is over, and everybody survives, and we all have a good laugh and go home. Except we never went home. We always we just had another shot. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's a, a heck of a thing. I saw, I mean, I saw a stunt man. I was working on a film in Bulgaria, and it's one thing to watch somebody do a high fall from a distance, but we were standing on one rooftop, and the building next to us was another six stories higher than this, and I saw a stunt man fall past me like that faster than you can throw a golf ball toward the ground, pew, like that. And he landed in an air shaft Jesus. Two buildings on a stack of boxes, cardboard boxes. And he must have gone eight stories and got up and said, I invite you all to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I, that must've been a hard landing cardboard. Huh? It's, it's a, uh, it, it, you know, you see your, you see your friends do this and, and they're, you know, I say this in all sincerity. Uh, all of us in this industry who've been in it after for a long time have seen friends of ours that didn't make it. So it it can it can be quite serious, you know. So it's 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 a it's a game for big boys and big girls, you know. It yeah. really is. Yeah. When I watched the and we were talking a little earlier about imagination in these movies. When I watched um Beastmaster as a kid, there was one scene that always stuck with me. And it's it's a it's a memory that is not a correct memory. 
I have a, a, a memory of somebody raising an, an infant, a baby, and throwing a baby into a fire. And my memory conjured that it was, it was a child, it wasn't a baby, but my memory created a baby. And I have a memory of this baby falling into a fire. And I remember going, how the hell did they pull that off? There's so many scenes. When I talk to people about this movie, everybody has a different memory, a, a favorite scene. And it always comes out a little bit more embellished. And I think that's great. I think that, you know, is really a, a powerful thing that the movie, you know, is able to do that. What's your favorite scene in the movie? Well, What's the know, one that really moves you? Before I tell you whatever my favorite scene is, because I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to let, I'll have to let that percolate for a moment. But, but uh, you, you know, um, the Beastmaster came out at a time when post-apocalyptic movies, the whole post-apocalyptic movement as an artistic expression, as a storytelling thing, was just happening. And so Beastmaster had all the freshness of this wave, this cresting wave that was just breaking about this post-apocalyptic parallel universe kind of system in which reality was bent and twisted. And, uh, and, and so when you think of a scene and you think of something like that child being held over somebody's head, it was probably Rip Torn. <laughs> yeah, oh, it was, yeah. <laughs> Rip, uh, it, Rip, by the way, Rip Torn is a lovely guy. And he, whenever he would see me after having made the beast man, he'd yell, hey, singer, hey, singer. It's the only film they'll ever remember before. <laughs> he, used to, he would yell that. And of course, he then made Men in Black, and then and, uh, and uh, we all remember him and that and so many other things. He was a lovely man. He was a great man. Yeah, the first time I saw him, I'd heard that he was difficult to work with. And I was on the set, and uh, I was talking to the director about some shot that we were doing or something like that. And somebody was standing here just off to my right in a sport jacket and uh, turtleneck sweater or something I don't remember and I was saying yeah this is and I looked like this and I realized that's Rip Torn and I'm you know I'm the lead in the show I'm the Beastmaster and I went da, 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 da. And I looked at him like, oh my god I said and I jumped on him and I kissed him you know because what are you going to do when you're near Rip Torn you've got to and he went oh <laughs> <laughs> he had a fake nose and everything everybody I didn't make the connection that that was Rip Torn until yeah. Much oh, later. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We got along famously. He was he was lovely. He was lovely. John Amos, who uh, uh, played Seth, uh, the first time that he and I saw each in our wardrobe, he came around one side of a dressing room trailer, and I came around the other side of a dressing room trailer. He's all dressed in this kind of sadomasochistic skulls and black straps and things like that, and I'm dressed in a hula skirt. And we came walking around. We took a look at each other. And we, we started laughing, that kind of laughter that you can't stop. And we literally, each of us fell to the ground and, and we're, we're gasping for air for like a long time. Uh, that, was a, that was something. You were asking me what, you were asking me what scene was, was my, my favorite. In, but I have to, I have to, if you don't mind, follow up. No, on that's that. fine. When you saw each other and were laughing, was it like, what have, what have we done? Do, can we run? Should we run away? <laughs> but you went on and you did the role and you, oh, you yeah. were, were you embarrassed by the costume? Never. Oh, never. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not ever. Not ever. Uh, and, and, and the reason uh, is not from uh, any sense of immodesty from me, but because they had been pointed uh, in, 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 uh, in cinema history. Uh, by others who uh, wore less and were uh, and were I would have to admit greater artists than I, Toshiro Mifune. Anybody who's ever seen the Seven Samurai or uh, or any of those uh, Kurosawa epics, they wore scantier clothing in many of their scenes than we wore in the Beastmaster. So I I, I felt I was in good company with as little as I was wearing. But I mean, there are two moments in the Beastmaster. Now I mentioned Mifune, as a matter of fact, there, there are two moments in the Beastmaster that that uh, that are favorites of mine, and and one of them is on screen, and one of them isn't. And the one that's on screen is just a little shot of uh, there's a, a hilltop and a bluff, and the camera is looking up this way, and the Beastmaster from the back just comes jumping down into view takes a look and then exits camera. That's one moment. And, and a second moment that's like, and these are just little vignettes that I, that I like, 
is there's another scene with the Beastmaster running toward camera up a riverbank, up a riverbed rather. And he's swinging his sword as he runs. He's getting ready to go into battle and he's just practicing. And he's running up the stream, swinging the sword. And I remember the, they, they said, just run toward camera and swing the sword because we just need to show you. And I said, give me a moment to think about it. And they said, what's to think about? Swing your sword and run up the, run up the stream. You know, that's all we need. I said, just give me a second. I said, I thought about it. And then I realized what I was doing. So I said, okay, I'm ready. I said, action. And I ran up the stream, swinging the sword, trying to cut the bubbles in half, the drops in half that came up from my feet. And that's what I was doing with the sword, was trying to cut those drops of water that were splashed up. And then I felt it was legitimate. So there was very little we did in the Beastmaster that we didn't give our whole heart and soul to, that we didn't think was legitimate in some way. Uh, the thought that I, the, 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 the scene that stays in my mind, however most powerfully, was the first day that I received the sword from the uh, sword maker, Vic Anselmo. I went up on the top of one of these bluffs in the middle of the desert, and it was about, must've been about 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. The sun was just beginning to crack the horizon. So the whole desert was sort of a lavender color and gray, gray lavender. And I looked down at the tiger, at Kipling, this 450 pound, beautiful, massive tiger that was dyed black. And he was between two handlers and he was crouched the way a cat will, only he was very still and very pensive. He was a wonderful guy, a wonderful animal. And I could see in that instant how ferocious he was, how massive, how capable, and at the same time, how fragile. And at that time, that was when I decided that whenever I was going to be on, film, on camera with him, that it was gonna be about him, it was not gonna be about me. And so even that way, uh, uh, we were developing a, 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 a kind of an emotional reality that I think really carries the film even, even to this day. There's a sincerity about it that I think speaks well for it. Yeah, that makes total sense. And you, you can feel it watching the movie. There's something bigger, wider, there's just something special about this movie. And the animal handlers, when they, when they saw me interacting more and more intimately with the cat, they said, you've got to stop doing that. That thing is going to eat you. You don't understand. And I said, no, 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 we're developing a relationship. And, you know, they thought, well, <laughs> actors, you know, um, anyway, he was the first person I said hello to every morning and the last that I said uh, good night to. Oh, I know what I was going to every evening. I know what I was going to tell you when we first got together to to work with the tigers, because you have to take a whole bunch of tigers and figure out which ones you can work with and which ones you don't. You can't. I said, look. I'm going to be working with tigers. I don't work with tigers. I'm a, you know, I'm an actor from off the stage and Shakespeare and what I mean. Is there some thought that I can have in my mind, you know, to communicate, you know, sort of develop a relationship? They say, you want a relationship with a tiger? Is that right? Yeah, I said, I just want a thought that I can hold on to. Well, here's a thought you can hold on to. They said, cat, mouse. <laughs> and I said, oh. I said, I, I believe I can, even I can remember that. <laughs> When's the last time you've oh, seen Beastmaster in full? You know, it's a, I have to admit, it's been a long time. But there was a time when Beastmaster was, was playing. It was uh, the most requested film on one of the cable networks. And um, whenever I would be channel surfing, which I do you know, habitually, and Beastmaster would be on, I'd get caught in it. And not, not because it was me and my film and all that sort of stuff, but I would just go, oh, there's an, and then I, oh, well, this is pretty, I got to come on, let's go, go where you're supposed to go, you know? But I mean, I, I think it has a certain captivation to it that, uh, that I, I, I was susceptible to, too. Yeah, where, where we live, we're outside of uh, Philadelphia and, and one of the Philadelphia channels as a kid would play it over and over and, and every single time it was on, I got caught in and I would watch, it would always be a different segment because the movie felt massive. I felt like I was watching 20 movies because yeah. I was watching them in, in pieces. 
Yeah, it, it was a, it was a big undertaking. You know, you were talking about you were saying you were in Philadelphia and it kept playing on the uh, on some channel over and over again, and that reminds me again of of uh, its iconic stature or status. <laughs> I remember a film, I don't remember the name of the film, but I know that Chevy Chase, I saw a glimpse of him in a film once in which he was all dressed up in a Beastmaster suit with a, with a rubber owl <laughs> built into it on his shoulder. <laughs> and I always, I, I've only, I've only seen Chevy once and I, but I always wanted to, to say to him, you know, <laughs> when I think of that, it sends me to my knees. It really does. Yeah. What was that? I don't really remember. I don't, I don't remember, I don't, but you know that kind of look that, that Chevy gets, I kind of, like, I just remember him standing there with this, <laughs> with this big muscly suit on and a kind of a rubber bird on his shoulder. So that was excellent. I remember part two coming out. I remember it being on Earth. I remember how, I remember the tone was a lot different than the first one, but it was okay with me. I don't remember the third movie. I'll have to get caught up on that. And the series I wasn't familiar with, but it really kept going for a while. It wasn't a one and done production. This story, maybe it's still going. I, I know that it's uh, I know that there's still, uh, uh, there's still a lot of life left in the concept. I think they did an extraordinary job with the first seasons or two or three, whatever it was that, that uh, it lasted as a series when it was produced in, uh, in Australia. Uh, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy task to write that kind of fantasy. You would think it would be all you have to do is have a few witches and a couple of fires burning and maybe a sword fight here and there. But it's a, it's a, it's a tough, tough storyline uh, to, to keep, uh, keep true to. And I think they did a really good job in the, in the series that followed. I went down to uh, Australia and, and acted in about uh, uh, six, I believe, episodes. Uh, down there, I was uh, in, in which case there was a younger man playing the beast master and I, I was his mentor from another realm and also directed an episode uh, while up there. Uh, but I think they did a really fine job with it down there. And as I say, I think there's still life in the story. I hope more comes of it. If I can, let me change uh, channels and we'll talk about V. You know, so I've already got your face pretty memorized from watching Beastmaster all those years and then suddenly. Uh, I don't even know how old I was, but then V comes on TV. And I'm like, oh, Beastmaster's in this. We got to watch this. Okay. So it's a mini series. Now that's the time you talk about, about how alive the industry is. This is the first time that anybody has ever said to me that I knew you from the Beastmaster. And then when you came on V, I said, oh, it's the Beastmaster on V. I got to watch this. That's an interesting connection for me to hear. I never heard that before. Really? No, no, you think I think of my work as being uh, like uh, like maybe yearly ledgers. You know, there this one, this year was this, and this year was this, and this year was this. But that thought of personal identity changes for me because it's a different role and a different role and a different role and a different role. Yeah, so I guess in a kid's brain, it's all kind of you know mashed yeah. together. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. So it was a mini series. I wasn't familiar with what a mini series was. Um, was it the first? miniseries no the first the first miniseries i think was uh 79 park avenue and uh and, and actually i was in that also that was way back in the in the old days that was uh that was uh, from universal studios so we made 79 park avenues uh for park avenue yeah With leslie ann warren she was the lead she was wonderful i mean this was a big production i've never seen anything this big on tv before uh you mean v yeah Oh yeah, yeah. It was a very big production. Oh, that's a, well, that's what I was going to say about Beastmaster too. Is that is that the same thing with V as with Beastmaster? Is it was done in the old style? You know, it was film. It was actual film running through the gates, and the actors performed as many of their stunts as they could, so that eventually on V, man, if you if I could think of something to do, get blown up in a car, jump out a window, drive a car, slide a car around a corner, fight, kick, jump, run fall off of buildings, if I could think of it, they'd let me do it. So the going, going to work every day was kind of, was a kind of a let me at him experience. And I got to, and I got to, I, I, I take nothing from David Ellis, who did a, a extraordinary job coordinating our stunts, but he was also very generous in allowing me to design 
many of my own action sequences. So that that it was a it was a, a wonderful time. I enjoyed every moment of it. I really did. I like asking our guests the questions about you know the differences between a movie set and a and a TV production. Um, so I like I appreciate what you just said. Is a miniseries more like a TV production where you get more freedom? I found that of the three feature film, miniseries, and regular series, that the miniseries was my favorite. I always felt there was a kind of, it was a hybrid between the large size, large scale, large production values, and um, just the whole effort that went into it, all the building, all the trucks, all the backstage crew, all the stuff was the size of a filmmaking, of feature filmmaking. But at the same time, it had a kind of a crush about it that intensified the work because you had to get that shot, those shots, those scenes on that day. And therefore everything you did was sort of intensified by that by that pressure. And that pressure forced this gigantic entity, which is the production, into a focus. And, uh, and what fired out the end of that barrel, what came out, that, uh, out of that uh, was very often explosive and fun and certainly gripping. You never had a moment to rest or think. You let your mind wander. You had to concentrate on the next moment and the next moment and the completion of this moment and the fulfillment of this moment and the, and the, and the speed at which television demands that, that, uh, that you work also intensifies the energy and the commitment of each moment. So I like the, I like the miniseries because it's encapsulated like a feature film, but it has all of the stretched out quality of a, of a series, except that that also is then compressed into a moment which, uh, which really intensifies the experience. So I guess I'd have to say that, that the mini, mini series is a hybrid and I, and I really enjoyed that. That's interesting. I always wondered if, if it was maybe a movie that somebody had decided, hey, why don't we put this on TV instead? But clearly it's not, it was meant to be a mini series. Uh, I think so. The, the, the obvious out of a miniseries is that if it's successful, we'll turn it into a series. And if it isn't successful to that extent, you say, well, it was, extent, it was successful for what it was meant to be. It's, it, it's only failure that, that always declares itself definitively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a scene in that movie. And again, it's another one of those things I will never forget, like the uh, the throwing the baby into the fire, which clearly I, I recreated in my mind. Uh, there's a shot of you hiding in a, a vent. You're taking photos and two of the aliens are in there. And the one woman opens her mouth to put in a, a, a rabbit or a rat or something and just ate that. Oh, man, did that mess us up as kids? We went to school the next day. We said, did you see that? We were blown away by V. It was such a phenomenon. When, again, this was this was no CGI. This was no CGI. They had to build a head. This is, this is, look, many of us were already veterans of the of the whole filmmaking process in television and feature films and so forth. So we we were pretty blase about this stuff. We were we were backstage laughing and having a great time and doing our work really seriously. And you know we were on the, the we were on the cutting edge of a winning team. But they brought in this head and Kenny Johnson, the auteur of V said, come here, I want to show you this. Watch, come here, come here, everybody. And we all gathered around, the crew and the cast were all there. And he brought in this head that looked like Jane Badler, who played the wicked woman. And it had a lever in the back. And the lever made the jaw stretch like this. See, it was a big rubber head. Looked just like her, Jane Badler. Looked yeah. just like her. Yeah. And we were all looking at this and Jane was like, oh man, that's weird looking. And they took a rat and they said, watch how this works. And they went oh, and opened this huge jaw and dropped this rat down in it and went oh, and the rat ran out the other side into a cage. But the whole thing was so horrifying that all of us went, whoa, like this. And we all ran. Everybody split. Everybody ran away from this thing. <laughs> it was I mean, it was it was as bad. It was as bad in real life as it was on film. And we, we all sat there and watched it happen. Yeah, that was a that was a funny moment. That was good. Very memorable. 
Yeah. In that in that scene, by the way, where I was looking through the grating, where yeah, I was looking through the grating and so forth. And right. So forth. Right. Yeah. The ending of that scene was shot. That was the very last shot of the miniseries. The ending of the scene, because the alien looks up into the grating and senses that I'm there, and he tears off the grating. And this was all. This was one of the stunts that I was fortunate enough to 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 design or talk them into. Uh, David Ellis made sure that nobody died, but but um, he grabs Mike Donovan out of this grating, and to demonstrate how much stronger they are than we my idea was that he would hurl me sideways across the room into an overhead bulkhead and then i would hit up against it sideways and fall down into the bunk below and so naturally they had to do that at the last as the last shot of the miniseries because the the chances of me separating a shoulder breaking my scapula or dislocating my neck or breaking a hip were intense no matter what you did to there was very little room for any kind of padding or anything like that and it came off really well but i do remember that i did in fact in coming down off that wall sideways wham down that i did hit the end of the of the bunk and that my my hip was sore for you know a uh, short while afterwards but that was the last shot and 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 that's why they do this because well, if, he, if he's injured, we're all done. We got what we need. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is it hard to shoot a movie or a show out of sequence? It was. Uh, I came from the stage. Uh, I was in the legitimate theater. I was doing Shakespeare and Chekhov and all that sort of stuff. So uh, there were two things that were very, uh, there were many things that were difficult to understand about film. And shooting out of sequence was actually less difficult because if you're on stage, you're used to doing exactly the same gestures and being exactly emotionally and intellectually the same from scene to scene, performance after performance, after performance, after performance, and even in building it in rehearsal. What's surprising in film is that, they, is that you have no time to think about that. You'd better come ready to do everything you need to do. And if you make a decision, you'd better be able to change to accommodate what else has been decided in the interim between you learning your lines and you hitting the set, you'd better be able to integrate that with all the other actors and director and cinematographer and camera people and all that sort of stuff. You'd, be, you'd better be able to hit your marks so that you're not off screen or out of focus or uh, out of the light and do all of those technical things while giving a committed and, and uh, correct and intelligent performance. So, I mean, it just, it just was really, really, really different in, in that way. Uh, the other thing is that there are uh, different demands uh, on an actor on film than there are on stage, and they're fulfilled differently. Uh, I remember I was doing Planet of the Apes, which was a television series back in the day, and uh, uh, I was giving what I thought was a bang-up production. It was the first production I'd done here in town, as a matter of fact. I was guest starring uh, with Bill Smith, uh, a wonderful, wonderful actor and a, and a lovely, lovely gentleman. And um, uh, I was acting, oh, you know, and I'd come from the stage, oh, hey, what do you think? And they cut, says the director, lovely guy. He said, let's, uh, let's relight. He said, we want to get the camera over here. And he walked up to me and he said, he said, so I hear you've been doing a lot of stage. Is that right? And I said, yes, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, that's great. Where are you working? I said, at the Geary Theater in San Francisco. That's the ticket Sam Spade takes out of the wallet of his dead partner in uh, the Maltese Falcon is to the Geary Theater. So I said, the Geary Theater. You know? Oh, he says, that's great. How many people does that seat? I said, oh, you know, 1,300 people. He said, oh, where would the mezzanine be? I said, oh, you know, about way back. I said, back in over there. He said, oh, wow. He said, that's, so that's where the mezzanine is, huh? And I said, yeah. He said, you see one here? <laughs> that I said, is my performance a little big? He said, little. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up stage work because that's what you're doing now. I mean, you're still very much in show business. You're doing a lot of stage work. Yeah, yeah. When the coronavirus uh, pandemic shutdown hit, uh, we were in production for my 
first legitimate theater play called Gary's Place. Prior to that, I had been playing Macbeth at the Southern Shakespeare Festival in Tallahassee's 1500 seat amphitheater. And before that, directed and played Oberon in Shakespeare's uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, so yeah, stage work you for sure, yeah. I have trouble reading Shakespeare. It's very complicated stuff. I can't imagine doing what you're doing and being on stage with an audience trying to memorize all of that and still think about, you know, your, your physical performance. That seems really tough. It definitely takes training. It definitely takes an education in Shakespeare, but it is foundational to all acting. Uh, and if you can act Shakespeare, then you can act anything. You'll notice I didn't say anything about the quality of my work. I only said I could do it, but I noticed that people who are, trained in the more modern uh what are your what are your feelings kind of techniques there they have less ability to do shakespeare whereas those who are trained as shakespearean actors they can do that and shakespeare and so uh, shakespeare is i uh, for anybody out there who's interested in becoming an actor or an actress a director or writer study shakespeare study shakespeare and 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 uh, see see the See that because because any acting, whether it's on film or whether it's on stage, all writing, all acting, all directing depends on architecture. And if you can understand the architecture and the components that go into it and be able to put them together logically, you'll be able to act. What do you prefer better? What do you like doing better, stage or film? I like doing good stage better. Good stage is hard to come by. Good film pays better. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but good stage is uh, uh, in every way more satisfying to the soul and more exercising to the spirit. Working on film is uh, gives you a great deal of satisfaction, uh, but it's uh, it's almost like working in a bottle. It's almost like it's like it's like building a ship in a model. You know, it may be beautiful and it may be incredible and and maybe other people help to the rigging masts and somebody mission that the ship rests on and all that kind of thing. But on stage, it's just you and your buddies, girls and girls and guys. It's just you and your buddies taking that audience to a great place and doing it night after after night, after night, after night, so that you get better and better and better and better. And so the audience goes crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier. Stage work is uh, the stage work. And, and it's, it's difficult. And that's a difficult thing to achieve because the, the magic of ensemble, the magic of getting everybody together to do this one thing and come into a single kind of focus, bang, uh, scene after scene and moment after moment, that's not easy to achieve. That's casting sometimes gets that right. And sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So uh, now that the uh, coronavirus pandemic is sort of winding down, do you have anything scheduled? Uh, coming I don't up think it's winding or? down. I think you're a bit quick on that little well, judgment. I don't, I don't believe it's winding down. I believe that uh, if you look at the charts, that it's beginning to trend up again. Uh, and that's a concern, I think, for everybody, not just for actors. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a big issue. Yeah, I've heard somebody say locally here, they're like, yeah, now that we're on the other side of it. I'm like, uh, who told you we're on the other side of it? No, we're not. We did take a look at the charts. And that's un that's a, that's terrifying. And we are going into, you know, we're going into winter. We're going into the flu season. So we've got that as well. I think what you meant, Casey, because we've talked to some people that it's like, even though this is still happening, I guess some productions are trying to figure out a way to resume. Yeah, so yeah. I guess, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to be argumentative about the point. I, I didn't mean. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. Take your point. You were going someplace with it. And I understand what you're saying about it. And what you're what you're essentially saying is now that we're sort of used to it. I mean, it's a it's a heck of a thing to get used to. But I'm I'm with you on that. I'm kind of like, yeah, I get it. I you know, I can wave to my neighbors if I go out on the street. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. I'm. I didn't mean to get argumentative. No, no, no. I no. I understand. No, I just meant with more places opening up. I wasn't sure if you had anything scheduled coming up with any of the uh, performances. 
No, you know, I, I, uh, I have, um, <laughs> I, I have the luxury sometimes of being able to do things because I want to do them, despite what, what business associates tell me that I should or shouldn't do. So I, I, I just formed in a film called The Undertaker's Wife. Uh, and it's just a very small role. It's a cameo role. But I really wanted to play this guy. He's a, a sheriff in a small town where The Undertaker and The Undertaker's Wife are up to some nefarious, <laughs> no good deeds. But apparently, maybe I am too. Hey, can I can I digress for just a moment? Sure. Uh, and, and touch on the subject of V one more time. Absolutely. Okay. I actually, this is the first time I'm turning into one of those actors that if you if you say, okay, we'll meet you on location, you have to send somebody to take me to location because I'm <laughs> wandering around in an airport someplace looking at the, you know, looking at the architecture or something. And then until somebody gets me. I used to be very, you know, I got, I got that. I'll be right there. You know? yeah. Anyway. So actually, I actually remembered before uh, getting on this, uh, this communication with you guys, I remembered to bring a souvenir from V. And I think this may be the only one of these that still exists. This is my personal, Mike Donovan's personal ray gun from the series and here it is oh that's wow. awesome see that yeah did you have to steal it or were you, were you oh, allowed no, they, to have it? no that when the show was over they said take anything you want they came out with with all the wardrobe all the all the alien wardrobe and said you want this we'll just load it in your car and i was <laughs> so tired by that time and i didn't know i was younger so i said no no thanks very much but i could have had all that wardrobe but anyway this is the only one of these that i think is from the original show that's Still, awesome yeah, it is. Wasn't it? It's a great design. Yeah. You know, this. Is it plastic? Is it metal? What is, how do they make that? It's a composite. I'm glad you asked. This is some sort of obviously clear plastic plexiglass kind of thing, although it's solid. And the rest of this is some sort of, you know, uh, uh, what do you, what, what is that they make ours out of these days, you know, whatever that is, uh, you know, that everybody's decrying. Anyway, this is a, but here's the reason, here's how you can tell that this is an original, by the way. We rushed into production so quickly that the, that the property department, the special effects and properties were making these things before they were, re, were turning these things out before they were really ready. So if you take this thing and you lie it on its side, like lay it on its side like this, after a while, it's a little cold today, so this is a little stiff, this plastic. But after a while, the nose will, will be droop <laughs> like this. Oh, really? <laughs> so the, the way you get it straight is you have to turn it over on the other side and wait for the nose to droop until it's just straight. And then you go, okay, I got gotcha. you. You know, right? Like this, see? Yeah. <laughs> and, what, and what happened was that everybody that they gave these things to right? As props. Here, you take this in this scene, use this in this scene. Here, you make sure you have one of these in this scene. The barrel would be bent like this, you see. So naturally, they'd take it and go like this, trying to straighten it and snap the barrel right off. Ah. So there are very few, if any, of the original that are left that still have that little barrel. Wow. There it is. Very cool. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. I'm glad you guys were, you know, I, I had to, <laughs> I had to go, I had to go open one of my drawers and search under all my clothes to find it. So there it is. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get into some of the fan questions. And, uh, I had one of my, uh, I had two of my own, but you sort of already answered the one. Do you have any more rip torn stories? <laughs> I, I do know, I, I, I only, I have an anecdote, I have a, uh, this is a, I can't attest to this being actually true, I only have, this is secondhand information, wouldn't stand up in court. But uh, one of the people that worked on our show uh, is a man named, St uh, named Chuck Bale, and he came on to kind of uh, chaperone uh, the the new production company and make sure that everything was running right. He was one of the originators of the Stuntmen's Association, which is the first guild for stuntmen in this industry, as I understand it. He also was an Academy Award 
uh, nominee for his role in the movie, The Stuntman. And uh, he would, he, uh, I learned so much from him about filmmaking and so much from him also about acting. But he said that there was a scene in which uh, Rip was supposed to be furious and uh, he got Rip furious at him and had him so worked up and so angry that when they turned the camera on, on Rip, Rip was still like, <laughs> and that they said, cut, print, beautiful, let's go. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I think you have to be a big stunt man, a big tough guy to do that to Rip. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, so I have one more uh, question of my own. Um, were there any moments, you sort of answered this also earlier, but were there any moments in the Beastmaster that you were scared of the tiger or you said you were sort of getting to know the tiger during the, the production, but were there any moments that you had where, where it was a little iffy? The very first shot I had in the Beastmaster. Well, I, let me, I, it, 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 let me tell you about, about selecting tigers. We went on to a place called the gentle jungle and the gentle jungle was a place out towards San Bernardino out East of here. And uh, it was a, basically a, a film menagerie. They had macaques and chimpanzees and uh, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, they had everything. So we went out to this place and uh, they said, let's see these, let's take this tiger out and see if this tiger is, suits you and see if he or she would feel comfortable around you and you'd be feel comfortable around it. We were walking along with a tiger between us, one of these 400 pound tigers, Bengals. We were walking along and they were saying, yeah, this looks like this is, this is great. And then suddenly the tiger who was swinging its head back and forth like this, the tiger took my entire leg in its mouth and we all just froze. We all stopped. And the tiger had my entire knee in its mouth. And we all sat there. We all stood there and we all thought about the clouds. <laughs> we all thought what a nice day it was. Thought quiet, quiet, very quiet thoughts. Private thoughts. Very private thoughts. And then the tiger let my leg go. And we said, well, we'll find another tiger for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, what was amazing about that was that you would think these gigantic canines would have felt like that on your leg. But what was extraordinary was that instinctively they found every soft part in the knee structure and inserted themselves in those. And they were so gentle and so tender that if she'd wanted to take my leg, it would have been gone in a whisper. Wouldn't it be like that? That was amazing, that was an amazing experience to feel. And then they said, okay, let's, uh, hey, let, hey, Mark, can I come on? Let's show Mark what, what uh, sugar bear can do or honey bear, I forget what they call it, sugar bear, honey bear. Let's give a honey bear, sugar bear can do. They said, well, let, let, we, let's, let's, show, let's show you. Hey, Mark, wait, come, here, come here, watch this, watch this, watch this. I said, go stand over there, they said. No, further back. <laughs> No, around the other side of that cage, go all the way around the other side. So I'm all the way, I'm looking through this chain link cage and they went over to another cage and they got a grizzly bear out of this cage, out of this gigantic uh, chain link enclosure. The nastiest looking little piggy eyes, bristly, golden <laughs> and the bear came out of the cage <laughs> and, and they kind of got it out of the cage and they said let's show the trick that it can do come on <laughs> see and then they and they and you know what the trick was the trick was they could get it out of the cage and back into the cage <laughs> that was the trick and so you're the, and, and when i saw that i was like i would have fled oh oh and the very first shot of the Beastmaster, when they finally said, when they said, uh, when they, they were finishing up another shot, another sequence, and they said, Mr. Singer, in those days, I was still Mr. Singer, Mr. Singer, uh, you'll be up next. Your first shot is coming up next. So I went on down to the set and that same bear 
had just whomped the bejesus out of one of the handlers who was being dragged away between two other guys. And they said, okay, you're up. I said, you're on. And that was, I was, I was next. You're next. Oh, I would have fled. Oh, it was, yeah, yeah. You know, my first shot was, uh, Ace Master, I had to jump into the quicksand. That was the very first shot. Never met anybody before. Never, hi, how are you? Jump in the quicksand. That was my first shot. Where the, where the little monkeys. Yeah. Came. Yeah. How, what does that mean? Is it just a big pit full of mud? Whenever they use the uh, quicksand uh, thing in movies, I'm always wondering how the hell they make these quicksand pits. You know the big, you know the big uh, cardboard forms that you can pour cement as footings yep. into? It's a big cardboard form sunk into the ground and filled with whatever they want to fill it with. And then you jump into that. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy about the bear. You're next. Yeah, and good. Hey, yeah, thank you. There's a. Uh, there's one other. Yeah, there's one other. There's one other tiger story. As long as we're on it. Sure. We were out in a place called. This was for one of the other subsequent uh, Beastmasters, two or three. I can't remember which. They said meet us at four thirty, four forty-five in the morning, outside of Los Angeles, north of here, in a place called Tick Canyon. Tick Canyon. Oh, that must be a picturesque place. <laughs> so so uh, I went out to Tick Canyon and they had, must've been at least 12 feet, high, maybe 14, 16 feet high, a chain link corral. And they would get these and they said, Look, we're going to, we're going to try some of these tigers and see which one we're going to work with in this next show. The next beast master. I said, well, what happened to Kipling? No, Kipling's retired. We, he doesn't work anymore. I, I, I wish I had time to tell you about Kipling, but what a great animal. What a, what a great personality. What a, what a Buddha. Um, anyway, so they brought out this tiger and they said, and, he, and again, it's like 450, 500 pounds, with a head the size of a washing machine. It's five o'clock in the morning. We're all cold. And uh, there are three or four other handlers and there's the, another handler and myself standing here. We're all inside this corral. And they let this tiger into the corral. They say he's a good, and then what they say, he's a good cat. He's a good cat. He's a good cat. He's a good cat. But they hand you a club, a big club like this, see? And they've all got a club. And as they're handing you this club, they say, he's a good cat. He's a good cat. He's a good cat. See? So the guy is standing here. I'm standing here. The other guys are down the way over there. The cat comes walking by, big cat like this. And the handler, comes, I'm here, he's here. Handler turns to me and says, as the, as the cat comes by, he says, you know, he won't. He goes like this. Because the cat stands up on his hind legs, nine feet tall, and bites right through the guy's arm. Jesus. Like, and the sound that it made was like tearing a turkey leg off a Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> One of those kind of sounds. And it put its canines right between those two bones, like a hole punch, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and immediately, all the other handlers jump on the cat and drive it back into a corner and get it back into its cage. And the last I see of this guy is he's in the back of a pickup truck with a tailgate flapping down below. And it's jouncing off across picturesque Dick Canyon with the blood running down off the tailgate on his way to emergency. And he's saying, as the truck is disappearing, it's a good cat. He's a good cat. <laughs> <laughs> I've always heard that the uh, the tiger, I read this somewhere, maybe it was IMDb, and you had mentioned that it was Bengal tiger, died? A uh, Bengal, Bengal tiger. tiger. Yeah. yeah, so evidently there's scenes where you can see he would just, uh, was it he or she, would just lick he, he, the makeup he, off the uh, face and you could see the real tiger under there. He was, he was so fun. He was, he was, he was a wonderful, wonderful, I'm not kidding you, he was, he was so wise and so patient and so kind and and I the the style of, of kung fu that I study is called hunga fu hawk, 
which is tiger and crane. So uh, maybe it's a conceit, but I felt that I had some sort of kinship with him through the forms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then, well, I saw. But uh, he's still a tiger, and I respected him. And it was only once that I ever got impatient because I was so tired. And I said, come on, Kips, we got to, let's get this. And his tail just went like this. It was like, no, no, don't, don't talk to me like that. And I was like, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Sorry. And that was the only time that he ever admonished me was just that little, that little move. He was, he was wonderful. Wow. He was wonderful. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll get into the fan questions now. Uh, John Anderson wants to know, was that you doing the Hulk screech? And oh yeah. Can oh, you yeah. still do the Hulk screech? Oh, you bet I can. <laughs> oh, you bet I can. I was in, I was making a, I was filming something in Vancouver, British Columbia once. And I, you know, it's what I was talking to you about earlier. I don't know whether this will make the final cut here in our conversation, but that's why I, I don't, I just go do my work. I don't, I forget that other people have associations with me through work that they've seen. I mean, I know that I, that I'm recognizable, but I just don't have those associations particularly. I went into a coffee shop uh, one morning, early one cold morning in British Columbia and uh, went in to get a cup of coffee and they all went, that's a Beastmaster, it's a Beastmaster. And the place was full because it was early morning. And I said hello to everybody and got my coffee. And, oh, there's, there's, a, com- there's a commercial on the air right now where they, where they, where they say, hey, it's uh, save 50% on your insurance. You know that one, that, that commercial? No. Okay. Well, anyway, so it's, it was that kind of a scene where you walk in and he goes, Oh, it's him. And uh, I was like, Oh, I get this. Okay. So then that was very friendly. Everybody was very nice. And we all sort of had a big group talk, you know, and then I went back out to do my work. But as I left, I turned around and stuck my head back in and went, yeah, like that. And, they, <laughs> and the place erupted in, in, in applause, you know, and it really <laughs> echoed in there too. So it was good. Yeah. That's great. Oh, well, there you have it, John. He can still do it. All right. So Lee Kindler wants to know, do you have a favorite role in uh, television or film that is ra- rarely talked about? Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure I do. The one that comes to me just offhand was, uh, you know, sometimes the thing, sometimes the things that give you the most satisfaction are the are the seem to be the smallest and 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 it's noteworthy. I grew up as a fan of the Twilight Zone. Uh, when I was a kid, that was a that was a new show. Every episode was the first time anybody had ever seen it, and I don't think I missed many of them. I pl- I got to grow up when I became an actor. Lo and behold, they revived the, the series, uh, the Twilight Zone, and I played a baseball player a guy who was unhappy with his marriage and unhappy in his modern, in the modern world, who was a dreamer. And uh, uh, sure enough, through something in the Twilight Zone, he looked at an old, he had a, 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 a like a nine-year-old girl that, that idolized him and was his buddy. And she gave him a, a baseball card and he became a baseball player back in the 19, back 1910, 1915 or something like that, and had a, a, a great career back in, back in those days where he was a has-been today. And uh, it was a very sweet story, and I enjoyed playing the character, and I enjoyed all of that. So that's, that's probably a favorite of mine was the Twilight Zone. Nice. It's a small, oh. it's a small, small piece out of the whole career. Sure. I have to look that up. I, I'm a big fan of the Twilight Zone myself. I appreciate it. So, uh, all right, Matt Brewer wants to know: Do you have any Burt Lancaster stories from uh, "Go Tell the Spartans"? Oh yeah. oh yeah. Well, I mean, I, I uh, "Go Tell the Spartans" is a, a f- about the Vietnam War experience. Very. This was made very close after, very soon after, the uh, United States cleared out of Vietnam and we all remember those pictures of the embassy with the helicopter taking off and the people scrambling to be the last one to get get aboard and and, uh, and all the people that were left behind. And so the extras in our set of the Beastmaster, which was filmed just north of here, 
where Magic Mountain is now, uh, out in the uh, uh, watercress fields and in the cane breaks out there was where we filmed this. Go tell the Spartans. All of the extras were the were the families were the were the actual Vietnamese immigrants who had managed to make it out of Vietnam and were now the extras in our in our show. Uh, and there were colonels and captains and majors and generals and their wives and their their children who are now out here reenacting on film uh, a fantasy about the Vietnam War. And I was on the set with Burt Lancaster. So it was a, a real head spinner all the way around. Uh, but I remember I was, uh, I, I was playing his, uh, his adjutant, his, his uh, aide de camp, I guess you'd call it. And when we first started filming, we had a scene, he was sitting behind his desk like this, and he was the colonel, and I was standing here at his side. And all the rest of the cast and all the rest of the crew was gathered to watch this. Here's Burt Lancaster in his first scene on a film that we're all in, and I'm standing here and I'm thinking to myself, I'm acting with Burt Lancaster. I am acting with <laughs> Burt freaking Lancaster. You dig? So he goes like this, I'm ready. So they say, okay. Roll camera, and he's sitting like this, is action. And instead of acting, and I'm standing here, it's him, instead of acting, it's just him and me in his outfit. So instead of acting, he's saying his line, he goes, you know, he says, and he looks at me and I go, you know, you know, it's not in the script. What is, where's, where's, you know, he, he looks at me and says, you know, when I was a younger man, he says, and his face is old now and kind of wrinkly. Well, all I had to do was walk on the set and say, hey, baby. <laughs> and he goes like this. He takes a puff on his cigar and says, he says, well, who could resist me? He says, but as I've gotten older, I've had to learn how to act. He says. And the director, Ted Post, who is stunned, is standing behind, because the film is rolling all this time. He's standing behind there. Ted Post is a wonderful, wonderful, lovely man. He goes, cut. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first, that was my first moment of working with Burt Lancaster. And uh, he tried to teach me to walk on my hands. I've never been able to stand on my hands. Envied everybody who can walk on their hands or stand on their hands. I just can't do it. So at 70 years of age or whatever he was, smoking his camel cigarette or his Denobili cigar, whatever it was at the time. He says, here, kid, let me show you. And he gets up, he's, you know, he's overweight, gets up on his hands and walks around in the desert in a soft sand, see like this. And he, then he tries, and I try to do it and I can't, I can't get the balance right. And all this stuff. So I said, I just said, okay. So he goes back and he goes and do, does whatever he's doing playing liar's poker or something. So he goes off and does that what he's doing. And then I'm, I'm sitting there, I mean, I'm a young guy. This is, my, this is my first feature film. And the producer comes up to me and says, what's the matter with you? I said, what are you talking about? He said, he's up on his hands. He's walking on his hands at his age. What if he has a heart attack and drops dead? <laughs> Burt Lancaster's not going to have a heart attack. Right? That's Burt Lancaster. He doesn't do those things. That's crazy. And the final thing I want, I, I have two, I do mind, I have two more things to say about that. One of them is I was on my way back to the dressing rooms from the set. And I told you, these are all veterans of this nasty, vicious, brutal war, in Vietnam. And as I was walking up this dusty road to go back to the dressing rooms, suddenly the canes, cane break parted. And these two extras, these Vietnamese veterans, came out of the cane break at me like this. And one of them had a double-barreled shotgun. And he stuck it in my face like this. And he pulled each trigger in succession. Click, click. And then the two of them looked at each other <laughs> and laughed and disappeared back into the, into the cane break. 
And uh, that was, that's again, that's one of those moments when you think yourself making films uh, exists on a different level in a different universe than, than many people understand. And the last thing I tell you about, about that is that came the time when my work was through and the film still had a few days left to, to, to film before the company had a few more days left to film before we wrapped. And it was night, 11, 12 o'clock at night. And Burt Lancaster was walking back up that same trail toward the dressing room. So he must've been going toward the set and I was going toward the dressing rooms. And I stopped him and I said, Bert, I said, uh, I just wanted you to know what a great experience this was to share time with you on the set and to be working with you. And I said, you're a, a shining example for everybody in, in our profession and, and, and beyond in the world. He said, well, kid, he said, I just got here like everybody else. And he turned around and he walked off into the dark. And that was the last I ever saw him. Wow. That's great. Great stories, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, Vera, I was very fortunate I got into town. People like Olivia de Havilland and uh, Burt Lancaster and Henry Fonda and Geraldine Page and Rip Torn and Jack Warden and Maureen O'Sullivan. They were, they were still here and still working, and I had a chance to work with them. Uh, and not in just a minor role. I mean, I mean, actually work with them and become part of their uh, their own creative experience and 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 uh, share that sphere with them. And and uh, I was I'm grateful for that. I really am. I'm very fortunate. That's great. Uh, so is it all right? We still have a couple more uh, fan questions. I'm not sure how much time you have here. Where am I going? All right. All right. So uh, let's see. Blake Marsh says ask mark about the high desert kill mainly the dance scene at the campfire p.s i love that movie Ten Thousand volts wow that's wonderful which scene at the campfire did he mention uh, he just says mainly the dance scene at the campfire oh 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 god wow what a weird movie that was weird oh that was i was working with chuck connors uh as well as some other young uh young actors and um damn Boy, every once in a while, you know, you can see the faces of your colleagues in front of your, of your, of your, in your mind's eye, and you just can't grab their names out of the air. I'll go to hell for this, but that, but that's just where I am at the moment. So, but I remember the Rifleman. That was uh, Chuck Connors. Chuck Connors was the Rifleman when I was a kid, and everything was westerns. And it's amazing in this industry to think that you actually get to grow up and 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 work with these people that were fantasy land figures to you in your own childhood. And uh, before I get to the campfire sequence, which I hardly, which I, I'm not sure that I have uh, such interesting things to say about, but, I, but I, I'll but i tell you this about Chuck Connors. It's really interesting. And it, you, it, it, it gives you some hint as to the level of professionalism that exists in this industry and in the acting industry generally abroad. Uh, uh, and uh, taken as a taken at large, we had a big scene that we were going to. It was the first scene that Chuck was going to be on camera, and the three of us, the guys who were out there working together, that came up and met him in the desert. We'd been working together for two or three days, and so we all had kind of developed an ease with each other and a kind of familiarity with the way we were moving and the way we interacted and all that kind of stuff. And we'd help each other with lines, make sure we all rehearsed together and got our lines down, stuff like that. Well, Chuck was about to step into this cold, and he was about to do his work, see? So we went by his dressing room and knocked on the door and said, Chuck, he said, what's going on? Well, we, we just wanted to know if you wanted to do your scene because he had a big scene. He had like three, four pages or mostly his dialogue uh, while we all we just said, oh, really? And what else? You know, that kind of stuff. So we said, well, we, you know, wanna, did you want to do your lines? You want to go through your lines uh, before we get on the set? They're going to call us probably in a half an hour. They'll have it all lit. You want to do it? He said, well, I have my lines. Got, come, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Yeah, sure. Come on in. So we went in his dressing room. We sat around. Said, yeah, okay. So we gave the youngest member of our troop the script to hold. He said, I'll hold the script. He said, hold the script. I said, yeah. Hey, we said, yeah, you see, you had a chance to do your lines. He said, turn to the last page of that scene. 
And the guy turns to the last page of the scene. He says, start on the last word. I said, what do you mean? He start on the last word. Just look at the last word. He says, okay. And did the entire scene backwards, word for word. Word for word, perfect. He did it backwards. Four or five pages backwards. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, he was an idiot. <laughs> oh my god. I'm not telling you, you, you come across people like this in your world, in this, in this thing, and you feel about this big. You go, well, that's, that's the end. I don't know what I'm doing in this industry, obviously. I, Geraldine Page, I worked with Geraldine Page in a movie for television called Some for Joey. And it was about the Heisman Trophy winner, John Belletti, who dedicated his Heisman Trophy to his younger brother who was suffering from leukemia. And he was made famous. One of the things that, that caught the attention of the public was the Heisman Trophy speech that he, his acceptance speech. And so I was replicating the speech because I was playing Capaletti. And it was at a banquet setting. And Geraldine Page was my mom. And she's sitting out in the audience listening. And came to a point, now it's her close up. I'm up on the dais and I'm said, came to the part of my speech where I say, but most of all, now it's her close up. Most of all, I'd like to thank my mom. And so when I said, and most of all, I'd like to, a tear broke from her eye and rolled down her cheek. I'd like to thank my mom. And then I said the rest of the speech and the camera's on her. The director said cut and the crew is <laughs> wiping their eyes. Everybody's very emotional. It's just beautiful. And she says, let's do another one. And the director said, well, it was Lou Antonio. <clears throat> Lou, and Lou says, well, wow, that was wonderful. Geraldine, that was just gorgeous. She said, let's do another one. And the, she said, make up, come over here. Can I have a handkerchief? And she dabs her eye. And she says to her eye, she says, wait for your cue. <laughs> now I go back through the speech. It's the camera's on her again. And I say, I'd like to thank my ma, and on the syllable ma of mother, a tear breaks from her eye. And of course it's down her cheek. And she said, so she said, that's the one. That's crazy. I recommend for anybody, by the way, who wants to see this kind of acting, acting to see Susan Hayward in uh, I'll Cry Tomorrow watch that performance you get on your hands and knees to something like that yeah. you think actors today appreciate the art of acting that, that you're sort of describing for us no no i think i think few do i think it's a matter of training and the training depends on trend and what's trending now is not classical theatrical training What's trending now is all this inner work, uh, very selfish work, uh, very, very self -inter Where, where, What I call selfish work is where the actor believes that they're as important as the author. Uh, that's one of the things about Shakespeare and Chekhov uh, and uh, Ibsen and, uh, uh, and the classic theatrical tradition is that the, there's only one God in the theater and that's the author because the author creates the universe. And what the director and what the actors then is they serve that universe. And so my life and what's going on in my world and what I'm thinking and who I am is never going to be that important. That's the most important. And the audience doesn't care who I am and what my universe is and what I'm feeling and all this. They want to know what the author says through you. And so you're going to give them all that experience, but you're going to serve the play correctly. You're not going to serve yourself because if you just serve yourself, then you can just edit it on film and say, what a performance. Yeah. That makes, that makes me the important guy. Not, not the case. The performance is the important guy and the 
performance is what the is what the writer, the author, had in mind. Sure. Just a couple more uh, fan questions here. Yep. All right. Let's see. Alexander Ramos wants to know: Do you still train in? Uh, I'm and I'm probably going to say this wrong. Okay. The Hung Gao Kung Fu, or have you moved on to other systems of combat? No, if you're if you're if you're eating uh, if you're eating sirloin steak, you don't you don't I mean uh, filet mignon, you don't look for another cut of beef. No, it's the best. Hung Gao Fu Hawk is uh, uh, that's that's uh, taught by Master uh, John Leong of the Seattle Kung Fu Club. That's that's uh, that's the pinnacle. So uh, I stick with that. Sure. Are you still do you still are you still active in training at all? It, it's a lifelong it's a lifelong process. It's a uh, you know, it's it's not a. I, it's funny when I when I first uh, when I first thought about uh, studying the martial arts. I come from a family that's of musicians. I don't they're not martial artists by by any stretch of the imagination. And I thought, like anybody else, I'm going to learn how to throw somebody over my shoulder and uh, maybe walk off the beach with the girl on my arm. You know, that sort of stuff. You know, I didn't realize that it was going to be a lifetime of study. And that, uh, and that there was always going to be enough. <laughs> the mountain seemed to grow the higher you climbed. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see. Jeff Godbold wants to know: Do you have any stories about uh, Robert England? Robert England is such a sweet guy. It's almost uh, it, it, it almost it would do it would beggar me beggar my vocabulary. Uh, and do him an injustice to try to de describe it adequately. Uh, I'll tell you that he is uh, so understanding, so generous, so kind, and so sincere uh, about his craft as to be uh, one of those people that um, uh, you, you might consider yourself fortunate in life to, to meet, much less to, to get a chance to associate with in, in the work or in any kind of uh, personal way. I'll tell you a, a funny anecdote about uh, Robert Englund. He's one of those guys that knows everything about every film ever made in the history of the world. If you ever mention any film, if you say, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, Murder, My Sweet. Oh, yeah, that was directed by this. And uh, this guy did the makeup. And that one was a special effects. And it was produced by this. And just this litany of things. And it doesn't matter what you mention, just something like that. He's just... This guy is very serious about his craft and uh, very enthusiastic uh, uh, about the uh, about its legacy. You know? So yeah, he's wonderful. Cool. Uh, so Jeff also wants to know: uh, Do you have any stories about being Man Bat in Batman the Animated Series? Anytime you're fortunate enough to do voiceover in a series, it's like it's like getting to do radio in the old days because you all you put on your headset. Everybody sits at, around in a big room, uh, in a big studio, and you have your script in front of you, and you act essentially what is a radio play. And, uh, you know, the detective comes in and says, aha, so uh, that must be the word murder weapon. And then you say, now, look, I didn't, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. And then somebody else says, oh, Henry, I was so worried about you. It's just radio play, and it's so much fun to do. And um, uh, doing Batman, I remember, uh, I, I, just, I just remember getting to work. Again, it's, it's a way of getting together in the community. It's almost like sitting around the fireside and passing a book around and everybody reads a passage of Winnie the Pooh or, or Scrooge or something like that, you know? It's a Christmas Carol. Is that, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's that kind of experience. So when you when you do voiceover work like that, are you in like a room together with with the other actors, the other voice actors, or? Yes. Oh, yes. That's cool. Yeah, you're all sitting around there. I did uh, I did Duck Dodgers also, nice. and it was wonderful to see. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I played a I played oddly enough uh, uh, an action uh, figure actor who was very taken with himself. <laughs> So anyway, um, uh, but it was fun to watch somebody do Porky Pig and somebody else to do Daffy Duck and, you know, and then uh, and then to be in, 
<laughs> to be in to be in the cartoons with them. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I I enjoy. It. Yeah, you're all sitting around in the same room, and the director is in a soundproof booth over there, so that if uh, so that she or he uh, can push a button to communicate with you and say, let's take that line again. Uh, and uh, this time, see if you can give it this kind of shading or that kind of shading, and, and let's let's wait for this one to start or something like that. You know, just that kind of thing. So you're not watching footage; you're completely doing it like a radio show. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and they the, match the mouth to what you say later. You know what? Uh, uh, I just uh, all I do is endorse the checks. I don't know. <laughs> how, I don't actually know how it's done. All I know is that the directors must be geniuses because you have a you you might have a a, a kind of you have a script that has the, the words and there might be sketches the other side that indicate on the other page the opposing page that might indicate the kind of action that's going on but no you're not you're not lip syncing to to any preformed uh, imagery no very cool. All right, so we got one more here, and uh, this okay. is a question I think a lot of people want to know. Mike Justice wants to know, why can't we find Beastmaster 2 or 3 anywhere on DVD? And my guess is that it's purely a question of economics. That's what the industry runs on. Beastmaster 1 speaks for itself. Uh, the fact that you can't see 2 or 3 on a, whatever format that was that you mentioned I might tell you something. <laughs> Any format. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. But uh, uh, but I uh, uh, so boy, I I I wonder if I can get this foot entirely into my mouth. <laughs> I don't know if I'm limber enough to do that anymore. We'll see. <laughs> well, like we were talking with, uh, and Bill Bill asked you this earlier. Like, what was the success of Beastmaster, the first one, and. I mean, it, we talked to Andre Gower last week from the Monster Squad, and Monster Squad flopped at the box office, so there was no, never any sequels, never any toys, never any anything with the Beastmaster. I mean, that, it, you can tell how much it, I mean, how well it did just by the first one because there there were two other movies and then a, a series after that. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, well. You, this is what I was saying about uh, how successful Beastmaster was in its television series incarnation in the first couple of seasons that it that it existed down in uh, in Australia. Sword and Sorcery doesn't. Sword and Sorcery seems easy. It seems formulaic. You get some guy with muscles. You get some girl with. Uh, a, wonderful figure uh, get into animals and fire and uh, some castle backgrounds and uh, who cares what else is going on let's just do this thing I'm not trying to denigrate anybody else's work I'm just talking about the genre itself but what it takes to make a successful movie is what it takes to make a successful movie and that is craftsmanship and care and sincerity in the endeavor from everybody. And if any corner is cut, if people will say, oh, that's good enough, it isn't gonna be. Uh, again, not to beat the drum about uh, the Beastmaster, that's, in the, that's already in the can, as they say. But um, if you're gonna make a good movie, you're gonna make a good movie, period. If you look, look at, I mean, look at any other genre, look at noir. Look at Westerns. The good ones are with us today. The ones that they said, oh, this will do. They're not. It's just that simple. The rules are the same. Well, I mean, that's. I think that's kind of the bottom line for that. Yeah. Well, Mark, you, you've spent a lot of time with us today. Thank you very much for your time. You were very considerate to, to give us these two hours. You've I, entertained I, us and taught us a lot. So thank you. I thank you for the, for this is, this is, I, I say this bar none. This has been the most um, straight up honest interest uh, that I've ever, not to denigrate anybody else either, because everybody has their own format and everybody has their own intention and everybody has their own audience. But this is the only one of these kind of interviews that has been so open-ended, so broadly based, so patient, 
to 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 give everybody, you, me, all of us, enough breathing space to actually talk about some things and consider some things. So I really appreciate it. I had a good time. That's Thank you, Mark. A lot. Thank you. Yeah. Well, in closing, is there anything you want to tell the world about what you're working on? Anything in your mind? Um, no, it's too late. I'm a talentless cook. I have to go ahead and eat my own food. <laughs> Well, it's been, this has been a wonderful time. Thank you very much. Uh, as we grow as a show, you know, we'd love to have you back in the future and, and, you know, our audience, you know, we're, we're your biggest fans. Thank you. Thank you. Tim. Are you on any social media anywhere, Mark? No, I'm not. a. Are you, are you kidding me? I've, I had to have you guys help me to figure out how to do zoom. Uh, no, no, I'm not a social media. Uh, but right. I, uh, uh, I'm not even a social media, but I, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I need to, I need to figure it out. We got to get you hooked up on uh, cameo a lot. Have you heard of cameo? Uh huh. I used to, I think uh, my aunt used to have one a little, <laughs> but it, it gave, it gave me nightmares. I don't like to think about it. Uh, we got to get you hooked up on cameo so people can get a hold of you. Okay. Well, right. I'll send That's you, it. I'll send you all the information about that. You, you, you would do good on there. I've had people get a hold of me. Thanks very much. <laughs>